Plans for the first orbital Starship mission have been released. Starlink launches with a record-breaking Falcon 9 booster. A shortfall of Gravitas is spotted. Dogecoin is going to the moon. And we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. Earlier this week, the first Starship to complete a flight to 10 clicks and successfully land, SN15, was moved from its resting place on the pad to suborbital pad B, where it was promptly hooked up to a crane in preparation for hoisting, but that has not yet happened, in part due to high winds. Its landing legs, that were slightly crushed, have been removed, and now it's just a waiting game to see what SpaceX does next. Will they replace the legs and secure 15 to the pad? Do any Raptors need swapped out? Have they found any further issues during their post-flight analysis? All these factors will determine whether or not 15 does indeed fly again, but I'm sure it will. And if it does, chances are it will probably undergo a couple of stress tests first. The FAA has already approved flights for 16 and 17, as well as 15's first flight. However, it's not clear if they approved a second SN15 flight or to what altitude. And at this time, no road closings or NOTAMs are scheduled for the Starbase area. Meanwhile, SN16 is fully stacked down the highway inside the high bay at the shipyard and appears to be ready for its time to shine. But again, it will have to wait its turn. The Max-Q test nose cone was moved from the launch site and back to the construction yard where its cage was removed. So it appears it may have served its purpose, providing engineers with the data they need for faster flights and higher altitudes. And work continues on the orbital launch and integration tower. For the day, SpaceX can go real big with a super heavy booster also currently under construction. Definitely the big news of the week concerns details released to the FCC for a future Starship orbital test flight. Expected to happen as early as SN20, stacked on a super heavy booster, the two-stage rocket will lift off from Starbase, Texas and stage step approximately 170 seconds into flight. The booster will then perform a partial return and land in the Gulf of Mexico about 20 miles offshore. Now, this could be an indication that for this first flight, it will execute a water landing as they did during early tests with Falcon 9, but we'll get back to that in a sec. Meanwhile, the second stage Starship will burn to orbit and then do a powered targeted landing about 62 miles off the northwest coast of Kauai. And this is stated explicitly to be a soft ocean landing. So back to the booster landing. The verbiage used for each stage's landing is different which may mean SpaceX may attempt, or at least leave the possibility to attempt, some kind of hard surface touchdown. But I can't imagine them risking one of their oil rigs they're currently renovating, if one can even be completed by them. And I'm unaware of any kind of drone ship that would be up for the task. And again, why risk the vessel? But what do you think? Let us know down in the comments below. The objective for this first orbital flight is to collect as much data as possible to quantify entry dynamics and better understand what the vehicle experiences in a flight regime that is extremely difficult to accurately predict or replicate computationally. Also, SpaceX has begun receiving the $50 million grant they won from NASA's tipping point contract back in October. They're tasked with demonstrating on-orbit large-scale cryogenic propellant management and transfer for the Artemis program. Of course, the company will be using Starship for this, it was always their plan to refuel Starship in orbit before heading to Mars anyway. But now they're getting paid to make it happen. The contract is expected to be completed by the end of next year. The Senate has added an amendment to the Endless Frontier Act, directing NASA to fund at least one more company to build a lunar lander as part of the HLS contract for the Artemis program. If approved, it would authorize a total of $10 billion for the program, and funding would need to begin within 30 days of being enacted. Of course, this comes after SpaceX was already named the sole winner of NASA's entire $2.9 billion grant prize. But the other competitors, Blue Origin and Dynetics, filed appeals, and their lobbying appears to be effective. While litigation continues, SpaceX's winnings are frozen, and new NASA Administrator Bill Nelson concurred with Washington Democrat Senator and Chair of the Committee on Commerce, Space, and Transportation, Maria Cantwell, that NASA needs redundancy right now, not later. Meow. In other Starbase news, an arrest warrant has been issued by the Brownsville Sheriff's Office for Caesar Galaviz, the YouTuber who runs the channel Loco Vlogs that trespassed onto SpaceX's property a few months back to get a closer look at Starship 11 for his 15 minutes of infamy. In Texas, a Class B misdemeanor holds a maximum jail sentence of six months and a $2,000 fine. 
And Space Adventures has announced that MZ, the first person to book not just one seat, but an entire flight for he and his compadres on the first Starship trip around the moon in 2023, has also purchased a couple seats on a Soyuz capsule for a trip to the ISS in December later this year. He and his production assistant, Yozo Hirano, will stay at the station for 12 days. They will be spending three months in Russia training for their trip. Moving right along to Starlink, on Sunday morning, SpaceX launched their 27th flock of Starlink sats to orbit for their internet constellation. And liftoff. Let's go Falcon for number 10. Placing the total tally well over 1,500, this was the first time a Falcon 9 booster flew for a 10th time. A mark SpaceX aimed for since the beginning of development, and she'll get the chance to fly again, since it landed successfully on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You on the Atlantic. Greg Scott was standing by at the port on Tuesday to capture the arrival of the mission's $6 million fairing aboard the Sheila Bordelon, as well as the arrival of the fleet leading booster on Wednesday, looking extra toasty. The next Starlink launch is currently slated for Saturday evening. I'll be here to watch it with you live. And while we're on the topic of Starlink, Google has won a cloud deal with SpaceX to supply computing and network resources to the service. SpaceX will install ground stations at Google data centers, so users will communicate to Starlink satellites, and then the satellites will link to these data centers, ultimately leading to faster applications and lower latency through Google's cloud services. The deal could last seven years, and Google isn't the only cloud provider working with SpaceX. Last October, Microsoft announced it was working with SpaceX to connect Starlink to their Azure cloud. We've also got a few smaller updates to go over, so we'll rapid fire these. First, Daryl Sasse of SpaceExplored.com has captured and shared the first images of the long-awaited ASOG drone chip, undergoing renovations at a port in Louisiana. A shortfall of Gravitas will be the third booster-catching barge ship to enter the SpaceX sea vessel fleet, and is expected to help out with both the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy launch cadence beginning this summer. Second, the Doge father really is sending Doge to the moon next year. Doge 1, paid for entirely with Dogecoin, will deliver a 40 kilogram CubeSat as the payload of a Falcon 9 rocket. It will obtain lunar spatial intelligence from sensors and cameras on board with integrated communications and computational systems. To the moon! Next up, the crew of Inspiration4, the first 100% private passenger trip to space, has begun their astronaut training at SpaceX's Hawthorne headquarters. They're scheduled to lift off on a three-day orbit around the Earth as early as September 15th. And lastly, the first dedicated private passenger trip to the International Space Station, AX-1, is scheduled to launch in a Crew Dragon capsule for its eight-day mission in January. And now it's time for today's Honorable Mention. NASA's space mosquito, OSIRIS-REx, began its two-year cruise back to Earth on May 10th after lighting up its onboard thrusters and soaring away from its host asteroid, Bennu. Launched on September 8, 2016 aboard an Atlas V rocket, it traveled for more than two years toward its target asteroid and rendezvoused on December 3rd of 2018. It spent several months orbiting and analyzing the surface of Bennu, looking for a good contact point before descending down to its surface to quickly collect a sample on October 20th, 2020. Images taken a few days later revealed that rocks and dust were escaping the sampler head, so engineers decided to capsule the sampler to prevent further leakage. On April 7th of 2021, the probe made its last fly over of the landing site and began drifting away from the asteroid. It is expected to reach Earth, jettison the capsule with samples on board, and deploy chutes bra for a landing in the Utah desert on September 24th, 2023. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Appreciate you checking in. Shout out to all the supporters on Patreon and the YouTube membership program. Do have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed. So, some of you have been asking, why these messages at the end of my videos? Why not stick to SpaceX news? Well, three things. First, the show ended about 10 seconds ago. So consider this like a bonus feature. You don't have to watch. Second, this is my channel, so I'll do what I want. But you, you gotta keep politics out of space, Kevin, <laughs> said those living in fairy tale land. Look, I tried to warn you guys. The two are interconnected, all right? And it's, it's politics, it's exactly politics, that's holding up SpaceX's HLS grant we just talked about. And third, I explained why I'm doing this the first time I did this a few weeks ago. 
And then I went into even further depth with my explanation for members shortly after. And one of the several explanations I gave for these segments is that I see my country steamrolling towards a cliff. And I believe if my country keeps heading this direction, the window for human interplanetary exploration that Elon himself has called short and delicate will slam shut. Because space, like it or not, is influenced by culture, which includes things like politics and definitely the economy. Already under Biden's watch, we've seen a jobs report fall embarrassingly short of projections because of government handouts to people who just refuse to work in a market that is actually in a high demand for employees. And on top of that, we've got a crisis at the southern border. Long gone are the days of Trump's peace deals in the Middle East. Under Biden, chaos is rapidly enveloping the region. And like out of the South African playbook, the Biden administration's blatant racism is hurting our nation's food producers. Police officers who work for the same department I worked for are being villainized for shooting people who are actually in the process of committing murder with a deadly weapon. Yeah, that lack of common sense is definitely not taking us closer to chaos. Inflation is making the money that you worked hard for worthless because the Fed keeps printing more of it, so much so that the Bank of America is now concerned about hyperinflation. And if COVID shutting down all the big boys within a reasonable driving distance of my house wasn't bad enough, thank you very much, CCP. Chick-fil-A just announced that they are limiting the number of sauces you can have with your fries because of supply shortages. Hey, look, forget crypto, all right? This is the next world currency. But on top of all that devastation, now we find ourselves in the middle of an energy crisis. Last Friday, a Russian hacker group who call themselves Darkside, probably because they're a bunch of bungholes, executed a ransomware attack on the United States' biggest pipeline that transports 45% of the East Coast fuel supply. Biden wasn't even aware of this state of emergency until the next day. Shocker. But rest assured, his administration's on top of it. Colonial is a private company and will defer um, information regarding their decision on paying a ransom to them. <laughs> what? Okay, so we do negotiate with terrorists now, just to be clear. All right, I want to make sure our enemies know we're not to be trifled with. This administration is beyond incompetent. Keep in mind, this is the same president whose first act of office was to shut down the Keystone Pipeline and put 11,000 people out of jobs. And not to mention all the side businesses like local restaurants that were completely ruined because of his derp decision. And, and of course, now members of his own administration are saying pipelines are the best way to transport petroleum. Go figure. The pipe is the best way to go. Well, Kevin, this is why we need to go electric. Yeah, look, personally, I've already put down a deposit for a Cybertruck. But I'm also aware that not everyone can afford electric. And by the way, good luck booking a ticket on an electric plane. Because the airline industry, last I checked, also runs on gas. So all this is to say two things. First, our country is heading towards that ledge faster than I even anticipated. I mean, I just made that video a couple weeks ago, and I wasn't expecting it to get this bad this quick. A broken, bankrupt nation will cease participation in space. For example, you know, transportation shuts down, people can't go to work, goods stop being moved, companies like SpaceX stop receiving supplies, then they stop going to space. Gwen Shotwell recently said in an interview that it was already tough for them to find new supply lines during the COVID shutdown when we still had people deemed essential workers making deliveries with trucks that had fuel. And look, I don't mean to be an alarmist, okay? I'm just trying to be real with you guys and protect the thing we all love by calling out the threats. And this administration is quickly becoming a real issue. And don't take my word for it either. Just this week, more than 120 retired military generals and admirals just wrote an open letter saying the same thing. And for those of you who don't know me, which is basically all of you, I'm not just some dumb YouTuber uh, where rockets is all I'm informed about, okay? okay? I worked in the West Wing of the White House in 2008. Uh, I'm a former police officer, military vet, high school science teacher, as a lot of you know. I even held a top secret security clearance with the DIA. I do have multiple degrees in Homeland Security and Terrorism and Law Enforcement, as well as years of graduate studies in Homeland Security Administration and, of course, science-related fields, too. And I even went to seminary and studied philosophy for a few years. So I've kind of got a, a variety of experiences and education under my belt. And, and I'm just putting that out there, all right? It's not like I'm trying to argue from some sort of authority here. It's just me sharing my opinions on my channel 
about what's going on outside our little space bubble. And I'll finish by echoing what I said when COVID came to the States last year. Don't be afraid of any of this, okay? But allow any concerns you have to lead you to being prepared. And that entails being informed. See you guys next week.